So I'm going to make the first official feature request. I want to see right. either on the website or maybe as part of like the interface panel, some number in like a bloody font, this number of zombies <laughs> killed or something like that. Right. Killed, yeah. And it just increments <laughs> up and up over time. So yeah, some, some free uh, feature advice that I'm, that I'm willing to part with. I, I love it. I don't have a clue if I'll ever get that by our design team, but I love the well, idea. Well, okay, like Easter egg. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Purple font. An Easter exactly. egg for every time you like kill a zombie account, you get to go into a video game world and start killing a zombie. Still zombies, exactly. This is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself. I'm excited for today's sequel. This will be the first sequel we've had on the Identity at the Center podcast. Yeah, we've got another sponsor spotlight episode. These are fully sponsored episodes that we uh, develop in collaboration with our partners, and we're very excited to welcome back our first sponsor spotlight, which was Sunry Security. Uh, we actually had Sandy Bird join us way back in December of 2023. Feels like so long ago. But welcome back to the show, Sandy. Hey, thanks for thanks for having me back. I just couldn't stay away. It was so, uh, so much fun last time. I think we talked about uh, EVs at the end and heroes. We took an EV car. So it'll be interesting to see what today brings for uh, interesting topics. And we kind of kept that EV conversation going because we were talking before we hit the record button about EV stories and things like that. So I feel like there's this natural affinity there. But let's talk about Sunry because you've got some new things that you guys have announced. I want to get to that in a second. Now, this is your second time being with us, so I'm not going to make you go through your background. You want to hear that? Go back and listen to episode 251. We asked Sandy all about how do you get into this IAM space, but we do want to ask about Sunry Security. Tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Yeah, and Sunry Security has been around for, for several years, and we've spent a lot of time trying to get customers that are using cloud, AWS, Azure, GCP, to least privilege and remove a lot of identity risk out of their cloud. So in that other episode, we talk about, you know, <clears throat> kind of four steps to doing that quickly. We talk about unused identities and getting rid of them. We talk about finding your administrators, and removing some lateral movement uh, paths. But we've also learned a lot in those, those few years. And so Sunry, as it's kind of developed over time, has come up with solutions to, you know, fix these without generating hundreds of thousands of tickets for your developers to go fix. And I think we're going to spend some time on that today. We're we're building some pretty innovative solutions in that space, and it'll be a lot of fun to talk about it. Yeah, I'm excited to get into it. I, you know, there was a question that, I, that mm -hmm. I wanted to ask last time, and this is something that actually we had listeners ask when we have you know, folks like you on, mm -hmm. and that's really is how do we, how do your clients or customers measure success with Sunry? And I imagine we'll probably talk a little bit about that <laughs> when we talk about the, the the new feature that you guys just rolled out. But um, at a very high level, how do your customers measure success with your solutions? Yeah, it's, again, every customer does this slightly differently, but there's definitely key performance indicators if you want to want to call it that. The solution itself always measured a risk score, right? So, you know, we, we take a look at all of the types of risks that are there. We kind of generate a score from it. You know, maybe you get an 85 or something like that, and you want to reduce that down to a 70 or a 60 or a 50 or whatever you want to get to. And you hope that your production environments and where your sensitive data is is a low risk and you know maybe your sandbox accounts are, are a high risk but generally you want them all to start to get to be at a lower state we spent a lot of time trying to help customers do that and so you say well what's success and what's interesting is some customers built some great process they kind of operationalized it they found those critical things they wanted to fix they generated tickets back to their teams to say you know these applications and workloads you've created are not at least privilege. Here's a recommended fix for that. Maybe it's a new policy in AWS. Maybe it's a better role in, in Azure. Apply that to the, you know, whatever the workload is, deploy that out. You know, now you close the ticket. And so what would happen is, is that those tickets would get issued. The teams would actually do that. They would always test them through, you know, some sort of a staging or UAT environment. It would work. They'd move it to prod. The ticket would close in summary. Everybody would be happy. We'd celebrate. Um, and so what happens is over time, you close more and more of those. The risk goes down and everybody's is kind of celebrating. 
But when we actually started to measure ourselves against that in a way, we would find things like, you know, maybe a customer fixes 2,000 of these tickets over a 10-month period. And everybody's like, this is, we're super happy about this. And then you look at their cloud and you realize in the time that it took them to close 2,000 identities, they've created 4,000 more that are no longer at least privileged. And we have to build a history for that to figure out what least privilege is and the cycle starts all over again. And you start thinking there has to be a better way, right? We can't, you know, we have these interesting customers that have, you know, 50,000, 100,000 identities that are workload identities. If you're going to do that one at a time, and have people test them, not just like randomly rewrite the policies on them all, which maybe I would say that you could do, but not everyone's comfortable with. It's going to take, you know, you're going to measure this in months and years for success. And I think, you know, customers today, we're all a little distracted. We like these kind of quick wins. We needed to find a way to get to the quick wins faster. And that's, we're going to spend a lot of time talking with it today in the new product, but you know, customers definitely measure success using those risk scores. Let's get those things lower. I can show progress. Let's close tickets, right? Issue tickets, close tickets. I can measure success that way. But the real thing is, is like, is the actual cloud more secure at the end of the day, right? And I think, um, you know, even ourselves measuring ourselves as a customer needed a better way for that customer to get to that point faster. Sandy, I call this a sequel. And I think the best sequels are, you know, a lot of the same characters, but a new story. And you have a new story. And it's, you just announced this thing called the first... The first cloud permissions firewall. And by saying, calling it the first, it means nobody knows what it is. So can you tell us what is the first cloud permissions firewall? Yeah, there's a, and there was a lot of discussions about using the word firewall. Let me tell you, when we named this product, there were, uh, it was definitely a triggering word for everybody, <laughs> for pro or for con for using this word. But we, uh, if you go back to that original problem where we say we're trying to fix this 100,000 identities and we're fixing them one at a time and customers, we, we actually said customers are struggling with this, right? If you didn't have a dedicated team helping, you know, a lot of times the ticket doesn't get fixed, whatever it was. And we said, we have to flip this on its head. The problem is, is every, you know, development team building a workload is free to create any identity they want with any set of permissions that they want. And across all three clouds, you have like 44, 43,000 permissions or something like today. And you think, you know, to do some relation back to firewalls, there's an awful lot of ports and a lot of, a lot of IP space that you have. And no one says, oh, you can just have all the IP space and all of the ports. It's not how the, the world worked in networks. And so when we looked at the permission space, it wasn't terribly different than that. We were kind of letting the developers do anything they want. And we said, can, is there a way to flip this on its head to create a default deny state? And they said 43,000 permissions, most of these things are insensitive, but there are some of them that are really sensitive, right? Like there are permissions in cloud that allow you to take, and this is one of my favorite ones, take the file system off of this uh, running workload and make it a URL on the internet so that you can share it somewhere. It's like, who thought that was a good idea? But it exists in these clouds. And so there's certain permissions that are super sensitive. And how do you put those in that deny state? The other thing we did to kind of prove that this was a real benefit in doing it was we measured like, out of everything that has these sensitive permissions in cloud, how many of them actually used them that were granted them? And this is what got to be super interesting. Found out that only like between five and 10% of the identities that had them ever used them. Across all of our customers, you know, you're just talking, I don't know, millions, hundreds of millions of identities, whatever it is, don't use these. So why is it that we're giving them to everybody, but no one's using them? And so, we said, look, there's a way to do this where we can flip the model on its head. We can make this like a firewall with a default deny state. But the again, so now the problems start. If we do that, and then someone needs the permission, building a brand new workload that's never existed before, how are we going to give it to them and not screw up their workday? And so it's interesting. We used all cloud native stuff for this. There's no, in the firewall itself, there's no like proxy. There's no, you know, jump box. There's none of those things. It's all cloud native and it's programmed cloud natively, but it puts this deny at the top for the really sensitive permissions. Everything that needed them from the previous history has access to them. However, and that's only 5% of the things that were granted them. And on day two, what happens is as soon as somebody trips the wire and tries to use one that never, you know, they never did it before, but today it happens. And maybe it's a Terraform script, you know, deploying some infrastructure. Maybe it's a Jeff just trying to, you know, build a crypto miner in the cloud, whatever <laughs> it is, <laughs> it happens. They trip this wire. 
and immediately in whatever they use for chat ops, could be Slack, could be Teams, whatever it is, they get in the team that's responsible for that area gets a notification saying, this just happened. Do we want to give Jeff access to go and do that sensitive thing? They hit approve, Jeff gets notified, and literally within one minute, they now have access to that sensitive permission. But it leaves that 95% space basically never used and never granted. And it um, so it's a completely different model. And so what happens is, is that you kind of learn the history. You put these firewall controls. They're not actually firewall controls. They're using, you know, in Amazon, it's SCP. In Google, it's a deny bindings. There's these other ways of doing it. It puts these controls in place to create this default deny scenario. And then immediately after that goes into this permissions on demand model. And so you have this immediate contraction of this risk value. And so now you think about the Sunry platform measuring risk, you all of a sudden go from a 75 risk to a 50 risk literally in five days. And you want to talk about success, you know, people can measure that and say, wow, I actually made a difference in a few days. So again, triggering word, I, again, love to hear your guys' opinion on it, right? You know, is firewall the right word for this or not? Um, you know, we, we said one time, you know, firewalls weren't invented for networks. We think of them that way because we came from that world, but there was a firewall in my car. There was one in an apartment building between two areas. You know what I mean? Like firewalls are not unique to networks, but we as technologists think about them as a network thing, right? So again, it's, it is this bit of a triggering word. Love to hear your opinions, what you think, good or bad. Well, the last point was, was spot on. So point number one, you may know Jeff better than he knows himself. Um, you know, building a crypto miner. If he was a hacker, I could totally see him doing that. All right. Second thing is I love that default deny as a starting point. Because even when you were asking, like, is firewall the right term? I was thinking back to my networking days, and it was the the death rule on a firewall was allow any to any, right? Yeah. You, you remember that? Does that trigger something? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then it was like the smart firewall people knew that it was the default rule had to be deny any to any, yeah, you know, and then you start allowing things rather than working in reverse of allow any to any and start blocking from there. So to me, it, it's, yeah, it, it's sensical. I like the word firewall. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Jeff, do you have anything on that? No, I think it's, uh, I think it's appropriate. You know, if you're asking me, I'm in a marketing meeting. I'm always trying to find it with funny names. I would think of it like, you know, the cloud permission ban hammer or something like that. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at like Reddit or things like that to have fun with it. And that's why they don't look at me to, to name things. <laughs> that's uh, they don't, I don't get to name stuff either. You know, we had a code name of it called purple for the whole time. It was, it's still really hard to get that out of my head. I may call it purple sometime today during this call, but it, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have code names. It's good to have fun names too. That's a good little tidbit for people who are listening, right? Hey, show me, show me your purple. Oh, Sandy's yeah. going to know what that means. I don't know if anyone else. Oh, maybe it might be weird if you say something else, but <laughs> that could be a way to approach it. Um, I do want to get into this a little bit. I know that you, um, we're going to try something a little bit different here and look at it on an audio podcast, and we're going to try our best to kind of step through it. But the goal here is to see it in action so that Jim and I can ask some questions, um, but also encourage people, you know, go to the website. And if you want to check out this and other things, you can go to sunri.co slash IDAC, S-O-N-R-A-I dot C-O slash IDAC. And you can actually see the demo there and try it out and, and so forth. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I think maybe the talk track of us and you showing it to us for the first time would be helpful for us to ask questions and hopefully people find it valuable out there. This is an internet first, <laughs> an audio only demo. Of a, vis of a visual concept. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're all about first, you know, we were the first sponsor pocket. Now we're going to try the first, uh, you know, visual uh, audio only uh, demo. So we'll, we'll see how this works out. I think we're, we're going to try to be somewhat descriptive. If all has worked well in the audio world, you can see my stuff though, Jeff and Jim, correct? You can actually see a screen? Yes, can. So I see yeah, a, looks like a dashboard. Yeah, I see the interface. I see, uh, let's see, a few different metrics here. Perfect. So talking about sort of like how you measure success, right? 3.1 yep. thousand IEM users and roles with excessive privilege. That sounds bad. How do we fix that? Uh, over <laughs> exactly. 1,100 zombies. That sounds even worse. <laughs> so yeah, walk us through what we're looking at here. Look, we're, we're going to do it. So you, you kind of get it right at the top of the interface. There are these great statistics in four areas that you know we're we're going to we're going to look at. And um, you know the most complex one is kind of that first one you you talked about, where you have some number of identities that have been granted these really sensitive permissions and then you know 
they're not using them, so we should take it away. And there's uh, there's these great buttons underneath of them that people can't see, but you guys can see, called like protect identities or quarantine the zombies. And you know those ones are actually quite useful, but we even do things, simple things like regions. And so if you come all the way over to this side of the interface, you know, if you're not using certain regions, you can actually just come in, click corn or click disable these regions, and we will actually disable those regions. Or if you have unused services, we can show you the services that you're not using and, you know, you can disable those. This is the thing that's really interesting with these cloud providers though. Like every one of them has 300 unique services, but any given account or project that you're working on probably only uses 20 or 30 of them. And there's a whole bunch of dormant permissions in them that are not being used that are latent that if when Jeff breaks in to use his crypto miner, you know, maybe you've never used Lambda before, but Jeff can use Lambda to create that thing, in, right? And so we want to try to reduce that attack surface, you know, as we can through some of these. And if, Sandy, uh, there's works. there's obvious um, security benefits to that, but is there, there mm -hmm. potential cost savings to say, okay, we have all these unused <laughs> services, let's make sure we're not paying for them? I, I think there is. Now, I always... Uh, I always remind myself, you know, you have to solve the use cases you build stuff for and not try to make it too wide because then things get complicated for a well, while. Do you solve this use case for cost and do you solve this one? But there's no doubt that, and this is the regions and the services are exactly as you're saying, Jim, are the ones that accidental things happen in, right? Like I think AWS intentionally makes it so that if you accidentally spin something up in a region that you don't use, you never see it again. And But it shows up on the bill every month at the end of the month, right? And, uh, you know, the same thing with services. Oh, I was experimenting using, I remember this very well from our own sales engineering team. You know, some customer wanted to test something with, a, it was called a hyperscaler in Azure. So they dropped one into the account. And of course, it ran the demo account for a couple of months. And I think the thing started at like $1,000 a month. Right. And, you know, until we caught it on the bill much later, you know, no one even knew that was happening. So absolutely, there's a cost benefit there. Not our main target market by any means, but certainly it's going to help in those in those areas. So. So as I look now at the interface here. Oh. Uh, yeah. yeah so as I look at the interface here, I'm I'm seeing a list of services. Right. So EC2 and this, yeah. these look like AWS type things. Right. EC2, Cognito, Alexa for business. And you've got different categories across the type, account usage, things say like four out of 10, a sensitive access of 15, the sensitive permissions of eight. And then you've got a status column that says, well, there's a couple of them, but unprotected, partially protected, disabled, pending, and then protected. And then there's like a little button over the right that says protect, which looks like it's for things that have not yet been protected, maybe or disabled. Can you walk me through kind of left to right what we're seeing? and what those figures and data mean? Yeah, we wanted to make sure that um, we could break these kind of default denies up in a way where when you enabled things, groups of things came back. Because if you're, and I use the example, if you're going to update security group rules, you're probably going to do something with subnets as well, right? There's, there's, there's these things that go together kind of when you start to do them. And so we wanted to group them. So you have the service as an example, you may have EC2 or the IM service, and it will have a group of these sensitive permissions associated with it. And so you probably want to protect all of those at once because the types of identities that accidentally get granted EC2 star have all of the permissions, but again, very few of them need them, but the ones that need them probably need more than one, right? And so we kind of group those up. The, the sensitive, you know, you've got this kind of, you know, sensitive permissions column kind of tells you how many in that service, you know, have sensitive or how many sensitive permissions are in that service. And we did a lot of work on this. This is where, you know, we spent time, again, if you know enough about AWS as an example and SCP space, it's limited. You can't write SCPs that are massive. There's all these limits you run into in terms of the size of the SCP and how many you can have and all these things. And so we had to be pretty selective about what we were putting into those sensitive permissions. And so we did all this work on, you know, is this thing really sensitive or not? And I, you know, we, Get lots of examples that way. Um, and so again, each one of those, that's how many sensitive services you have. And then you have how many identities have access to that in those sensitive services. And we can drill in, we may do that in a minute. We'll drill in a little bit deeper in a few of these, but that will tell you, you know, out of the 75 that have access, how many really use it? Two, three, four. We may, we'll drill into that in a minute. And then when you hit that protect button, 
it doesn't actually protect instantly. What happens is you click protect and it stages the changes into like a pending changes state. And that's why you see that disabled pending, right? So if somebody's made a, a change, they put it into that mode. What we actually do is we build up this piece of infrastructure as code that actually deploys all the cloud native mechanisms for you that actually implement this firewall. And I think that's so important because it's not like we wanted to be in the middle of you know the the cloud intercepting every API call. We actually wanted to use the cloud native mechanisms that they've given you for putting these things in place and utilizing those. So what we've done is programmatically created that piece of infrastructure as code. You as the customer then go and deploy that. And so um, it's a way that you can kind of test this in one area of the network. Should I call it a network? We're now yep. right into the firewall world. One area of the cloud, an account, you know, a project that you're working on, you can protect it there and do that. And uh, so that's kind of the, all the calls. We may drill into one in a minute, um, you know, and then, you know, we can go from there. I, again, I love the zombies and I, uh, I wanted to show you guys this thing on zombies because I think it's pretty neat. Just like the services, we can find every identity that's basically unused. We use 90 days to start. You know, again, some people may want it to be longer. We can have a big, long discussion about how long something has to be unused for before you think it's unused. But what's neat about this is we can take every account, every project, every subscription, and we can tell you in there, like, what identities are unused. And when you actually click the quarantine button, we don't actually delete those identities at all. What we do is we basically short circuit their permissions so that they can't use any of them anymore. And why we do that is, is again, back to history. After years of doing this with customers, what we discovered was people were scared to delete this stuff because what happens is, is that maybe they have a, a process that runs every year and it does something, or they have an infrequently used device and they've used something in their cloud to configure it. But if you delete that identity and then you have to put it back, you don't know what permissions it needs. You don't need what the don't know what the identity was called. Maybe that's connected to a resource policy, so you can't put it back the way it was. Maybe it had an access access key, and I hope you didn't do this, but you hard coded the access key in your code. And now, if you've deleted that key material, you're going to have to generate a new one, and then you know have somebody fix the code before the thing would work again. And so we had this scenario with zombies where people just wouldn't delete them. And you know, this is a, a great demo environment. We look at this, but we had customers that have tens of thousands of unused identities sitting in their cloud and they won't delete any of them because of the fear. And we think this is a better way. We can basically clamp them down and say, you cannot do anything with this identity. But if you do come to the point that you need to, and we see it try to wake up, it gets a deny for the first time in seven months. Send the team a message saying, do you want to reanimate the zombie? You can reanimate it and the thing comes back to life with exactly the same permissions it had, exactly the same access key it had. All of those things are still intact. So, you know, I love the zombie story. Again, curious what you guys think about that. But it uh, it really is a way to kind of clamp down a lot of this risk uh, pretty fast it's, in these environments. It's super cool. I hope that instead of reactivate, it just says reanimate zombie. <laughs> there's there's a there's my marketing uh, for you on that. I want to go back yeah. to a couple of things you, you, you pointed out. You mentioned and... I want to make sure I heard it right. If I click protect to do something, you're not actually doing anything. You you mentioned you're staging a change and that you're using native mm -hmm. um, infrastructure basically as code to stage that change. Does that mean I can, as an engineer, look at that code and inspect it and make sure everything looks okay the way I can double check it and have that level of transparency? It, it's exactly true. And we... We did it this way. Again, we had a bunch of design partners. We've been working on this for, I don't know, nine months, maybe a year now. And we've had all these design partners along the path with us that have been kind of helping us with this. And what we found was editing these parts of the cloud are super sensitive. Like SCPs at Amazon are a great way to break something. You know, if you deny everything, all of a sudden you can't do anything in your whole cloud, right? Or if you create a deny binding in GCP, it, it overrides everything. So Basically, the customers are like, you know, this is a super sensitive thing for us. We don't want a third party vendor like Sunry having direct access to go in and change these things. And some of them had really strict policies that said, okay, all of our changes to this part of the cloud must be checked into GitHub. They must be PR'd. And then they must be deployed using some mechanism they had. And so we set it up this way so that when you do that, you know, set of pending changes, 
you can actually get this template. You can check it into GitHub if you want. You can, you know, have a PR on it. Somebody can inspect every line of that code and then go and deploy it into the cloud and make it active. And so we separated the permissions of the product being able to actually go in and make the changes versus automating how that gets done for the customer to go do it. And uh, it was it was where all the design partners settled with a good experience, right? You know, there's a few of them that said, I just want a button to press. Okay, well, you can automate the button and make it pressable if you want. But for the people that wanted those checks and balances, it was a great uh, intermediary for doing that. So, yeah. All right, let me show you guys a couple other things. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit, and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna show what it looks like when you get into one of those individual services. And it's the first time, by the way, we have light mode and dark mode, which again, you guys are seeing thank on you, the screen. As thank you, thank you. Dark yeah. mode should be the default <laughs> everywhere. And that is a hill I will <laughs> die on. <laughs> You'll die on, yeah. We, have, we definitely have developers that are in the same hill as you, and then we have a few of our support guys that like light mode. So it's a weird, you know, again, it's so it's much easier like on your eyes, especially very... at night. You have this, you know, nobody likes just glaring white screen, at least, you know, a dark gray. And you notice... We can talk about this on this podcast. You notice we snuck the purple color into the cloud versus firewall. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all about branding. Code name somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, look, so everybody uses. There's certain services you can't turn off, right? So it's nice to talk about unused services. But then, um, like if we go into EC2 as an example, every account's probably going to use those. And you know, you'll have some set of sensitive permissions with it. But when you look at an individual account, we can actually find automatically the identities that are using um, that. And so this is an example, this happens to be an AWS reserved SSO role that's using, you know, in this particular case, one of those, those sensitive permissions. But you can actually look at every service individually and see everything that is using them versus, you know, what, you know, has access to it. And so I think it's an interesting way. You think about that first screen with like 75 identities and then you come in and you find out well, there's really only five using it or 10 using it you really are compressing that open space of, of permissions that you have very, very quickly. So anyway, just a, another neat part of the product in, in that side. I know we've been looking at a lot of uh, AWS resources, I guess, from a uh, capability standpoint, is it similar for both Azure and for GCP? Are there differences in functionality? They're, they're, we tried to make it as close to the same experience as possible in all three clouds. I will say there's this, and I think we may have talked about this on the first podcast we did. Um, AWS and GCP are deny first models. So when you put a deny anywheres on an identity, it's denied to do whatever that permission is. And no matter how many allows you give it, you can never override that deny. Azure is not that case. <laughs> Azure is an allow first model, which you can put as many denies into Azure as you want. But if there's one thing that says rather through an inherited entitlement or a direct entitlement, if it says that you can do it, then you can do it. And so we had to change the experience just slightly for Azure because unlike AWS and GCP, where truly we, it was a centralized control at the top that we just said, you know, clamp this down and deny it. In Azure, we had to actually do some fiddling with the real policies that people were using to change them from an allow to a deny in that scenario. But we were able to actually, again, infrastructure as code is amazing. We were able to actually write the state into the, the RBAP assignments that we were doing to keep it um, a similar experience. It looks the same when you're doing it. It feels the same to the end user. But under the covers, it's quite different what it's actually doing. So anyway, always the things that you run into in, uh, in these. What is it? Okay. I'm going to, oh, I'm just curious. What does it take to set this up? I just connect it similar to, I guess, other services where I feed it my, uh, an admin credential, I'm assuming of, of each of these. We, uh, we deploy it with infrastructure as code as well. Um, so in, in AWS, we use CloudFormation In the other two, um, we use Terraform. Again, there's, there's different ways of doing it. Um, What's interesting is, is that it kind of goes in and monitor mode by default. So when you, when you deploy this, it's going to learn all the things about your cloud, how big that space is between what's been granted sensitive permissions and what's used it, how many zombies you have, what services you've used. And it does that using really light permissions. Think of like security auditor style permissions that can list and describe things, but don't have any ability to change anything. 
once you actually go live with this, so now you've deployed that, you know, you've gone from that pending state into the protection state. At that point, the thing becomes live. And there are slight different permissions that happen in the cloud at that point where the system actually needs to be able to change some resources and stuff, but they're still really light permissions. They're not, you know, control the whole organization and control the SCPs. They're just little light things that do the permissions on demand work we have to turn these permissions on and off on an individual exception basis. So it's pretty, it's pretty neat. I've actually got an example here we can show in AWS where once this has been set up, like and it's in its live mode. So again, you you onboarded, it's all done with infrastructure's code. It's a bit like watching paint dry. It takes, you know, some period of time to go and do this, but you've deployed these. If a developer's in doing something, so this is an example here, you see an AWS console and, um, you know, somebody's editing a security group. So we'll go back on that network theme again. And they were to edit one of these rules. So they're going in and they say, look, I want to create an, an inbound rule and they want to open up port 80 and port 22 or something. When they actually go and click this to do it, they will immediately get this deny response if they're not in that exemption list, right? And so the thing's been deployed. Someone has gone and deployed a bunch of controls using you know, their cloud ops account, so it's in the protection mode. They get a message that looks like this the first time that they do it. But what happens in our system is immediately after that is there becomes a request. And this, like I said, this can come in Slack, can come in Teams, come in email however you want. But fundamentally what happens is, is we detect, you see my example user here, Sneaky Jeff. I was honored so for a second Jeff there. Group. I had Je I saw Jeff I, contest yeah. and then oh, now I'm Sneaky Jeff. <laughs> now you're Sneaky Jeff. This Trying to get those Bitcoins. That's right. Like you're I said, get the you know him better than he knows himself. <laughs> exactly. I, uh, so, you know, Sneaky Jeff's in here. Sneaky Jeff gets denied. This goes to that team that's responsible um, to approve these. They click approve it. They can, you know, document why this is approved and all those things. And at that point, you know, Sneaky Jeff gets a message back and they can save this and immediately it works. And it's, again, we we play a little bit here in the demo to make this faster and speed it up so that we don't have to log into AWS. But that the reality of the situation is you go from being denied to being allowed to do something in minutes. It's It's literally from the time change and the Slack messages and the people clicking one minute later, you have permission. And it's, this is the thing that the design partners were super excited about. You know, it's one thing to be able to take all of this risk out, but it's another thing not to basically block the teams from doing their work when they needed to get it done. And uh, so, again, that was one of the biggest kind of epiphanies in building this thing was it's not actually about, you know, the cloud permissions firewall that's so important in that default deny. It's about enabling all of the teams to keep running at speed and not getting in their way. So... So, Sandy, I, I can imagine like one of the initial objections you might have from a cloud team is like, well, if they only have an AWS cloud or only have a GCP cloud, couldn't they get by with the tools that are provided within that cloud to kind of achieve? Like, do you hear this from Amazon customers where it's like, um, well, we can use Access Analyzer? Is that like, such a poor man's solution to this problem that it's not really a good question? It, it's interesting. I actually think, and sometimes I think about it this way, Jim, and I get this a lot in like talking to customers, especially customers that have not gone through the pain of trying this with Access Analyzer yet. So they've seen Access Analyzer's marketing material or they've seen Sunry Security's marketing material from before this point in time there's a, a perfectionist view that I want everything to be perfectly least privileged. And so what Access Analyzer is doing, it's going back through every permission that's ever been used by every domainity. And, you know, AWS, 14,000 permissions and Azure, 10,000 permissions. I don't know the numbers exact, but it's, it's high. And it's creating that perfect policy to put on that, that identity. And then you need to test that, right? So if it's a real workload, you now need to test it. You test it, then you get it to prod. And then you do it all over again. And tomorrow there's a new identity, but you got to wait 30 days or 90 days for Access Analyzer to get there. But I think in the early stages, even myself, when we, when we founded Sunray, that's what I wanted. I wanted the perfect outcome for every identity. And I think I just maybe have the scars on my back now from so many years of saying, we got to do something a lot faster to get to a lower risk much quicker 
and then go back and apply that aspect at a much more granular level to the things that are really important, right? The, the things that are really sensitive, they're really exposed. But I think the question is still very valid that you're asking, right? Like Access Analyzer, the Sunray solution that we talked about on the last podcast, whichever that's trying to do this perfection thing, I think people want to do that. I don't think we actually give our development teams enough time to actually do it. You know what I mean? Like they're not gold to get their app out the door because it's at least privilege, right? That doesn't make the money, right? And so, you know, <laughs> vulnerabilities are a great example, right? You got to patch your vulnerabilities, but you have to do that because there's an audit team coming behind you to say, are they patched, right? And we all know we probably have, you know, some, you know, backlog of those that we have to work at. So what's the chances you're going to get to this list privilege thing um, in that scenario? And so I think, again, your point's valid. I actually think there's a, there's a, uh, a reason to do least privilege. I just don't think people can execute it and operationalize it fast enough. So, yeah, that that's a great response. Um, you know, I'm kind of trying to picture this in my head. Like, okay, let's say we take this permissions firewall and we want to have it work in our AWS cloud as well as our GCP cloud. Do I go like install something? How how exactly does it work? Where does where does it go? Yeah, there's two, and again, in both clouds, slightly different deployment, but it's the same process. Basically, in the initial monitoring mode, you're putting in those security auditor permissions for the Sunray SaaS to look at your cloud. Um, you know, in AWS, if you're familiar with these things, you would actually be familiar with like the the managed policy for security auditors, pretty light. In GCP, um, it's a very similar scenario where it's just looking at like list describe permissions, list the um, service accounts that are there, list the you know, the roles that they've been assigned, like things like that. Um, and then what happens after that? So that's the first deploy, but we can see your whole cloud from that. And it, it you know, it takes 10 minutes to deploy it, maybe in a really big cloud with like, you know, five or 600 accounts, it may take a day to, to look backwards in time, 90 days so we can get history. But after that day, we have that visibility. Then you actually protect stuff and you click deploy again, that's another piece of this infrastructure's code that you're going to go run and put those controls in place. So, you know, you ask like, where does it go? Well, it kind of lives in the cloud with the rest of your workloads, right? You know, it becomes another identity with a bunch of permissions on it, hopefully not too sensitive, right? Um, that's actually monitoring your cloud. It's, it's all cloud native. It, you know, there's no, as I say, no man in the middle, no proxies, no weird boxes. It's a, uh, it's a great way to do it. So, yeah. and no vulnerabilities to patch because there's no there's no running workloads there. So, even better for you. Yeah, you brought up the the point about like um, no proxy, et cetera. So, this is just cloud, right? I mean, there is no version for the on prem because I would love to have something like this for on prem. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the first one who's ever wanted that. Assuming I'm right, and it's not for on prem. Why does anybody? built one for on-prem built on prem i uh and we talked a little bit about this in the prep call when we did this and i i had this you know whatever vision like why did sandy build a company in cloud cloud was this interesting enabler for the first time that allowed us to see all of the things that people were building and it was like having a real-time cmdb running all the time you say well why is that well in order for Amazon or Google to charge you for that Lambda function or that virtual machine or that big query table, they had to have an audit record that it ran and it had to be on the bill at the end of the month. And so cloud gave us this first time where we could truly see all of the workloads. There was APIs to find them. We could see all of the activity that they were doing. Over the last five years, I've realized not everything is audited and there are some exceptions to that rule, but the reality is most of it is. And, um, on-prem, and I spent years in the uh, security information management sim space, you know, doing these types of things. Man, CMDs were always so out of date. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, hey, this is what we believe it looks like. And then tomorrow it was out of date. And, you know, you had the, the, the admin that had the extra rack beside the rack that had his special gear in it. And it was like, it was so hard to find everything and even capture the logs all in a central spot that people just couldn't do it right it was just too out of control the way that you built your vm was different than how the other guy built his sap and you know how does this stuff all work but when you deploy it all in amazon or gcp you know those things are there we can finally get to them and so 
again, I think there's a huge benefit to possibly doing this on prem. I don't know that that's going to happen anytime soon because it's just too much the wild west. The cloud providers gave us this centralized point with a centralized set of APIs that could be predictable and allowed us to do this for the first time. It's interesting in GCP, this deny function that we talk about, it was only released like last year. They didn't even have that functionality a year ago. So you couldn't have even built this solution a year ago in GCP. Wow. So it's it's interesting that they're they're accelerating this way. Or you'd have to come up with some kind of like um, Rube Goldberg type solution yeah. to kind of, because it <laughs> sounds like that's what you did in Azure. It, uh, the, the Azure one, and you know, somebody would get mad at me if I said it was a Rube Goldberg machine <laughs> that we built for Azure. It's not, it's very, it's programmatic and it does it, but there is definitely, there were some struggles we had in the model in Azure because of how it is where, again, I, we don't have the demo up anymore. I'm not showing you guys it, but when you go into the, the Azure and you're looking at a single subscription or a single management group, there's an extra line on it that said these identities we can't control because at this point in the tree, because above this point in the tree, they've been granted permissions that we won't control at this point. They're just inherited. And because it's allow first, they have access. And so if you want to control them, you have to go higher in the tree with Sunry to control those levels. And there's just no way around that. And it, uh, you know, it's because of how their model works. So anyway, that's why, as you say, it's not a Rube Goldberg machine, mm -hmm. but there's definitely some differences in how that code executes compared to the the AWS and GCP ones. Yeah, I was going to say, I hope it did come off that I said it that way, but I guess that's exactly what it was. <laughs> Didn't mean to say it that way. I thought I should say. Um, okay, so imagine the scenario, you got a booth, you're at RSA or you're, you're at AWS Reinforce or you're at Identiverse. I'd love to see you guys go to Identiverse, but you have a booth. Now, who in the organization do you want to stop at that booth? I mean, who buys, who's going to buy this product? Is it the person who says, I need this to make my job easier? Is it the CISO who comes by and says, I need this to make my environment more secure? Is it the app developer who says, I need something so that I can have the security people get what they want? <laughs> like who, who's the ideal person to come by and then who usually does come by? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, those are the great questions. You know, the target for us is, and they have different names. It could be the cloud ops engineer, cloud infrastructure engineer, cloud operations manager. It could be, it could be the cloud center of excellence lead. I don't know. It's the person that owns cloud for the whole company. So if you have fifty teams building, somebody owns the GCP infrastructure for those fifty teams, and they're the ones that set the golden rules for how everything rolls out. They're the people that struggle with this and want to put the controls in, but are worried about breaking things, right? They, they want to put the SCP in to block it, or they want to put the deny binding in to block it, but they're worried they're going to break something. So we're, they're our perfect customer to talk to because they feel the pain. They see how this solves it quick. They love it. That said, they may not know our system exists and they certainly may not go to Identiverse, right? It's more likely at Identiverse, you end up with the CISO or the security lead for IM or something, and they're trying to get things to least privilege and they're talking that way. We want to talk to those people too, because we, they may not even know that much about how cloud works, but they know they have a big problem, right? And so rather it's the CISO or the head of identity or whoever it is that knows they have a problem around least privilege, we want to talk to them too, because they're a big help. The, the You talked about the app developer. Uh, it's interesting to tell them that, but they're not the person that can procure and buy this solution. They're, they at best would be a sponsor to talk to the next level. Um, they may find it interesting, but they don't even have enough power in their accounts to deploy it. So they're probably not the right target. Right. So it's the the person responsible for the cloud or the person person or group responsible for security. They see a demo. What when does the epiphany happen that um oh I need I need this. <laughs> there's 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 two epiphanies that happen which are super interesting, right? You know, one is when they see the demo with the permissions on demand thing, people love that. It's like, oh my land, we can we can grab this stuff back very quickly. The other one that I find so intriguing is the zombie one, which is why I gravitate towards it. Because people just know that they have these things and have no clue how they're going to clean them up, but they're scared to death to delete them. And they're like, seriously, we could turn those all off and then turn them back on? It's like, yeah. And people are like, wow, that's great. Um, so those are the epiphanies for the person walking up to the booth or that first call. 
for customers that have been trying to do this though for a period of time, this is a relief for them. They're like, oh my land, I, I can focus on the right stuff. I don't have to try to do this for a hundred thousand identities. I can get this thing in place and and go about my my work. And those for those people, the epiphany comes more on that sensitive permission clamp down that happens. So I'm gonna make the first official feature request. I wanna see right. either on the website or maybe as part of like the interface panel, some number in like a bloody font this number of zombies <laughs> killed or something like that right killed, yeah. and it just increments <laughs> up and up over time so yeah some some free uh feature advice that i'm that i'm willing to part with i i love it i don't have a clue if i'll ever get that by our design team but i love the idea well, it's okay, like purple an easter egg. <laughs> yeah that's right purple font. an easter exactly. egg for every time you like kill a zombie mm -hmm. account you get to go into a video game world and start killing a zombie still zombies exactly um so I think this sounds great. I love the demo. You know, we got to see the demo. Hopefully everybody else got to visualize it in their head. Um, but for people who want to try this out, Jeff gave a, um, a mention of, you know, where you could go to actually visually see the demo, which I think was uh, sunry.co slash IDAC. Um, but if someone wants to actually try this out what's the options that are available for them yeah this is uh and this is also a, a fairly large change for sunry security the company um we're doing basically 14 day kind of free trials of this thing you can just try it and if you like it that's great and where you've actually put all of the pricing for it on the website because the concern with some of these cloud tools are you go and it's like, I don't even know if I can afford this for my, you know, my world and I don't want to try it if I can't afford it. Right. So we've, we've opened all of that up. Um, so again, a bit of a different world for us that we're trying, but we think that kind of open pricing model, 14 day free trials, just go and try it, see if it works for you. The great thing about this is, is that you actually can figure out in 14 days, if it works for you, you know, you can get that visibility, you can pick a development account, you can put the controls in, you can try the POD out. It rather works or it doesn't for you and your organization. Our previous product was a large, you know, lots of visibility, lots of things that you could fix, but to get the full aspect of how you're going to operationalize that took a lot longer. And so it was a thing where it really was a bit of an enterprise sale where this is a small team can run this, you know, maybe you only have 10 AWS accounts, but it actually makes perfect sense for you. So, so Jim was talking earlier about conferences. Are you guys going to be at anything coming up? Maybe like RSA or, or AWS? Yep. We, uh, so again, a few of our people will be at RSA. Um, the big one for us is AWS reinforce, um, which is a, a fun AWS security only conference, right? If you go to the, the reinvent conference in Vegas, it has, you know, everything under the sun from satellites to whatever the security conference is just, how do you secure a cloud? Great sessions, great speakers. We got a booth there, a couple of speaking slots, which are, which are pretty neat. Um, so that's a fun one for us. We love that conference. It's a great conference. A um, few people at RSA, I think we're doing the Gartner IM one at the end of the year, which I think you guys go to. Um, so, so lots of places to see us along the path. So I can come up to a booth and you'll have people that can kind of walk through this demo yep. or I can go online, sunry.co yep. slash IDAC to, to learn more about it. IDAC, exactly. And I believe, I'm going to say, if, see if the website's ahead of me or not. I believe there's a click-through demo people can try too, which is not dissimilar for what I showed you guys. So I uh, I think there's a click-through demo there that people can click on and, and see how it works. So. It's really impressive. Definitely want to encourage people. And thank you for taking the time to kind of walk us through this. It helped seeing anything. And hopefully, hopefully people were able to visualize and sort of their mind's eye as we walk through it. But definitely encourage people to go check it out. I love the idea of not only just taking the data you're collecting, but doing something with it. And I think this is an area that a lot of people should be looking at is, okay, great. We've got visibility. Guess what? No more excuses. Now you got to do something about it. <laughs> so here's yeah. an easy button, literally, <laughs> right, to help with that. So thank you for that. Um, I want to wrap up with something totally unrelated to identity, or maybe it is. I don't know. But we want to talk about phishing. We were talking about you're going on a phishing trip soon. And I gave you kind of a, a list of phishing-related questions. And you were like, everything except that one. So I won't ask that one so i'll ask and said if you could go fishing in any body of water in the world where would it be and why look i've been i've been thinking about this question possibly for years 
<laughs> and I, if I was going to do it, any body of water anywhere hmm. in the world, I would go probably the fjords in Norway and I would spend some great time there and uh, I would go because it would be beautiful. It would be unique and I would have a great time regardless if I caught a fish or not. And so if I could go anywhere, that's the one I would pick. I Sure. I'm with you right there. I don't even think I would go fishing. I would just sit in the boat and just stare up at the giant, <laughs> you know, the, the, the scenery yeah, exactly. and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not much of a fisherman, so this is really out of question for me. And to be fair, the question I was that was in the original list was like a gadget related question. So I could definitely could come up with something like that. Jim, if you could go fishing any body of water in the world, where would it be and why? Not so much of a fisherman, but a couple thoughts came to my head. So one was... If you haven't seen the show River Monsters, which I think was on Netflix for a while, such a cool show. This guy, he's like, he's so entertaining. And then he goes fishing for these monster fish all over the world. Like he'll be in the the um, Amazon, like fishing for these fish and they come out and they look like dinosaurs, right? So great show. This reminded me of a story that I just heard. So Denise told me that one time her father, her father and his best friend went for a fishing weekend. And instead of fishing, they got so drunk, and they never went fishing. So what did they do? They went to the grocery store, bought a bunch of fish, unwrapped it, and brought it home <laughs> just so they didn't get in trouble that all they did was spend the whole weekend drinking. That's a great, I mean, <laughs> I would do that. That's totally legit. Yeah. Very creative, yeah. Very Unrelated, but I had a roommate when I was growing up, and I think probably in the early 20s, late teens, and he was trying to impress a girl, so he ordered Italian. And Italian got delivered, and they took everything out of the boxes and put it on plates and pretended that he had cooked it all. <laughs> <laughs> Same kind of idea. Uh, Chad, if right. you're out there, exactly. you know who I'm talking to. <laughs> um, and, and she was probably like, oh, this kind of tastes, this is, this is just like Olive Garden. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, look, you know, we're young, we're, you know, trying to figure things out and whatever you got to do to get by, I guess. <laughs> All right. This has been a great conversation, Sandy. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for coming back. Hopefully you'll come back in the future with other cool announcements you guys might have. Uh, definitely want to encourage people to go check out the cloud permission firewall. It's at sunri.co slash IDAC, S-O-N-R-A-I dot C-O slash IDAC. We'll have links in our show notes so people can check it out there, our website, et cetera, all that kind of good stuff. And of course, you know, you can follow Jim and I on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter, Mastodon at IDAC Podcast. We're on YouTube. We're on the web, IDACpodcast.com. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and leave it for this week. Thanks again, Sandy. And we'll talk with everyone else in the next one. Thank you, guys. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.